Hello, my name is Antonio Ricardo. I am showing you today a IEC 6150 overview uh, based on the communication standard. I'll be going over what it is, essentially what the standard is, and the protocols and architecture associated with it, as well as testing the new communication scheme and why use IEC 61850. I put this video together because I felt that there was nothing really out there that kind of gave a overview of everything all in one place. Now this is a definitely an overview of little bits and pieces of everything that you would need to know if you wanted to start with IC61850. So a little bit about me, I, uh, I've been working in the industry for about 11 years now. I started in substation engineering. I have control and integration experience and I've been a protection engineer for well over six years now. I also taught at a local university. So what is IC61850? If you look up the definition, essentially it's a standard for vendor agnostic engineering to configure IDs in an electric substation for automation systems so they could communicate with each other. It is a standard of multiple parts, thousands of pages. In fact, someone once told me that if you were to have read the standard from start to finish without stopping uh, with an average human being reading speed, it would take you around two weeks to read the whole standard. So there is a lot there and they put together everything and everything associated with the standard, how to use it, uh, the protocols involved and everything else. So it's a network based or packet based protocol. Uh, it runs on layer two networking. However, there is uh, a new R goose, they call it, that is a routable goose message, and I'll get into what goose message is in a, in a few. Um, the data models defined can be mapped to multiple protocols, such as the goose messaging, MMS, uh, sample measurement values, and I'll get into, again, what these are in a few minutes. So, it is a communication protocol essentially designed to model an entire su electric substation. It is non-proprietary, it's secure, and a reliable network communication within an electric substation. So what that means is that it promotes interoperability between systems from different vendors. So theoretically, you could take a vendor one and a vendor two, and they should be able to communicate with each other with some swapping of, of files, which I will get into a little bit on format of files and what they are. But um, the standard, based on the standard, if a manufacturer states that they conform to IC61850, they go through a defined vendor testing that is required, and again, based on the standard, uh, to ensure that the equipment conforms to the standard. Uh, KEMA is the uh, vendor testing and the forms that are the output forms I should say PIX, MIX and PIXIT are the forms that basically would dictate what came out of the conformance testing and it's all according to part 10 of 61850. So a little bit of definitions here. Uh, IED in case you did not know what that stood for, is intelligent electronic device, such as relays, merging units, and I'll get into what a merging unit is, controllers or meters, etc. cetera. Uh, what's a goose message? Uh, the definition is it's a generic object-oriented substation events, which is, it, it's a controlled model in which any format of data is grouped into a data set. And it is a multicast, messaging system uh, where publisher subscriber base which essentially a device an IED essentially publishes this 
message onto the network and any device that is uh, enabled or configured to subscribe to that message can see that message. These usually are your tripping, close, uh, brick or failure, stuff like that uh, messaging associated with the substation. Uh, SMVs, sample measurement values, they're used for transmitting digitized instantaneous values of the power system. So these are your analogs that have been sampled uh, or essentially converted from analog to digital. So they're your currents, your voltages, your, uh, your power, frequency, any essentially instantaneous values. So currently today, if you take a typical microprocessor-based relay, you would wire, hardwire in your currents and your voltages, and you would have inputs and outputs that are hardwired for uh, tripping and for status. So that device is currently taking the analog signal and doing an A to D conversion, sampling it, and making a decision based on the algorithm that's programmed in the relay. Now that whole process of A to D, however, is within the relay and it essentially it's proprietary. Now what you're doing with 16150 using what is a merging unit, and I'll get into what that is, you are taking that analog signal, digitizing it at the physical device out in the yard and bringing in a network-based signal to the network for any device to be capable of getting that information. So you can see right there, that's a fairly powerful statement right there. Uh, bay controller, it, it basically is an ID to provide uh, control over physical equipment. Uh, one could also add multiple other functions to it. For example, uh, break or failure, uh, lockout functionality, sync check, or auto reclosing, but essentially, it is. Uh, it also operates disconnect switches or line switches. So a breaker would utilize a bay controller. MMS is a manufacturing message specification. It's an international standard that deals with messaging systems for transferring real-time data and supervisory control information. This is more of a client-server type communication. It's different from sample values, which, by the way, are also multicast publisher, subscriber messages, very similar to Goose messaging. But MMS functions more like DMP, essentially. I wouldn't really, I mean, that's a borderline accurate, but essentially the concept is that you're pulling, you have a server and a client that the device asks for the information, so to speak. I won't be getting into MMS too much. Actually, that's probably the last time I'll speak of it. Uh, I wanted to focus more on Goose Messages and, and Process Bus, which again, I'll get into what that is. And the merging unit. So this is the interface from the physical analog world, your circuit breakers, uh, currents, uh, voltages, etc. Again, this is a device that takes the analog signals and converts it to sample values. Most of them also have uh, I.O. associated with it as well. Since it's out in the yard, it, it devices usually have current and voltage inputs as well as binary inputs as well that it will take and convert to a digitized goose message. So let's talk about the architecture now. So I'll start with bay level. These are essentially where your relays this is like the boundary between station level and process level, although at times station and process could be combined in one. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus on separate uh, levels here. So the bay level essentially is where your relays or your IEDs reside. So this is your border or your boundary between the two levels, utilizing different ports on the relay, or same ports again, uh, but for, again, for this purpose, I am going to focus on dividing these out into three. So let's talk about station level first. So the station level, again, is more on your 
EMS SCADA type functions, engineering, uh, it essentially is your connection between your station level devices like your DFR, uh, although your DFR is also connected to the process bus level. But um, HMI, uh, your SCADA, your RTUs, uh, station computers, station controllers, uh, this is where the status of the system, uh, the metering, all reside on this network. Again, it could be a separate network. In fact, good practice is to have a separate network aside from process bus level, and I'll explain a little bit why. Um, this data is tra transferred mostly according to uh, 8-1. And uh, again, it's, there's a report service, uh, and it's usually MMS. Some Goose service, although Goose is usually reserved for process bus. And how it would work, essentially, again, you have your EMS or your gateway, uh, your HMI station controllers, and your relays are connected to a network of some sort, whether it be switches or uh, other means. So. Again, the information is pulled and sent to the devices, and they go back and forth. It's not a one-way. It potentially could, uh, for example, from the HMI, you want to open a breaker. Uh, the signal would come from the HMI to the bank controller to open the breaker. Let's get into the good stuff now, or I should say the most complicated, process bus level. This is where your protective functions reside, essentially, or your protection. It's the connection between protection and control and the interface between the primary equipment. This is where your merging units, your CTs and your PTs, uh, power transformers, circuit breakers, disconnect switches, these are where these are going to reside in this, this network, so to speak. Your merging units, again, are your interface to these primary equipment such as circuit breakers or uh, current transformers, and they will digitize that signal onto a network uh, via a network packet. So this is where, where you're going to have your goose, uh, essentially your trips, your switch positions, uh, your sample value measurements. It needs to be more robust and reliable than your station level, obviously, because you need the relays need that analog signal to perform a a task if it loses that then you will not have protection function so it needs to be reliable i'll get into what prp and hsr is uh shortly whereas your station level since it's ems and scada which i mean if it did not get to its destination in a second or two it would not really affect anything. So what is a sample value? So the merging unit is essentially continuously sampling the analog data from a current voltage transformer, for example, and it samples it around 80 cycles or samples per power system cycle. Now 256 is also a standard sampling rate for more on the PMU side of things. Uh, but for protection functions, it is the standard usually is 80 samples per power cycle. So if you see to the right there, essentially you have like three-phase signal that is analog. The merging unit converts it to, to samples and sends it off onto the network. Again, this is a multicast message on a network, and then any ID on that network can subscribe to these. It's there. It's constantly in intervals of between 200 and 250 microseconds. A, uh, there is an issue with timing. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, a time reference is required essentially to align samples from multiple sources. I'll get into that uh, in a second, uh, how that works. These messages, sample values, uh, usually start with the uh, a destination MAC address of 01, OC, CD, and 04. The 01 at the beginning essentially means that it's a multicast message. In fact, goose messages are 
exactly the same as well, except that at, instead of 04, you have an 01. So if you see a message that essentially starts with 01, OC, CD, 04, you know that it is a sample value. And then the last four digits essentially are, are changeable uh, with a range of zeros to Fs. So why is time sync important? So let's take an example of a current signal from the same current signal from multiple merging units. So merging unit one and merging unit two, let's say. So if they are not time synced, their time reference will be off. Essentially, it will simulate uh, that their their phases are off. In reality, it's the same exact signal. And this is, again, because the time reference that each of them are on a different time reference. So therefore, it's gonna, you're going to have a delta in, in phase. So that, that's an issue. And uh, I'll get into more on quality uh, of messages. But essentially, that, that if you think about it, that looks like a fault if a device was looking at this information. The phases are off, so that potentially could be uh, interpreted from the device as a fault. However, in this situation, the quality most likely would go bad, and I'll get into what that means, and the device would probably uh, reject it anyway. So it, basically, the specification has uh, somewhat specifies um, time source accuracy, system accuracy. You can see the accuracy has, has to be very, very tight. Uh, in all honesty, uh, a accuracy of four microseconds is uh, it's it's pretty tight. So types of time synchronization protocols that is common in 61850 is uh, is one pulse per second, uh, which I won't get into the details too much, but essentially that requires you to have a separate fiber connection to every device just for time synchronization. So now you are adding another you know, fiber connection or uh, to, to perform time synchronization. The popular one, and it's, it's fairly new, is PTP, which is uh, Precision Time Protocol. It's uh, based on IEEE 1588. It's a more cost-effective solution. It could be applied to any uh, existing network. Uh, it uses, there's multiple profiles. I only listed two, but they have, th this PTP is not just for electric substations. So there's telecom profiles as well and, and et cetera. So the two big ones are power, power utility. Power utility tends to be the more uh, favorable one. And essentially what PTP does is it, it also incorporates something called best master clock algorithm. So what it does is it seeks out if they if a master clock, you have a master clock in the station um, most of the time too because, again, time sync is important. However, if that clock was to fail of some sort, the devices sync up and pick the best clock source and then run with it. So essentially what happens is you lose a clock, the system based on the best clock algorithm and uh, based on priority levels that are within the relay or the device, it w they will choose which one becomes the master clock for this station. So it, then it will automatically sync up to that time reference. Again, the, the important part of this is time reference, not so much whether it's GPS or not. Of course, GPS is favorable for a reference, uh, which usually these clocks are synced to GPS. But it, the most important thing is that they're referenced or they're all on the same reference, whether it be local or not, uh, mainly because of what I spoke of previously uh, based on the currents that you see to the right. Now, my colleagues uh, have done some testing, uh, more advanced testing on this. Uh, they've come across a, a few uh, 
nuances, I should say. Uh, it, the nuances are between like some inoperability issues between manufacturers. I wouldn't say inoperability issues per se, but the standard kind of specifies things from the time synchronization point, but the manufacturer chooses basically where to put that timestamp when it goes from, let's say, merging unit. I'm taking an example here. So a, a basic A to D converter, you would mostly, you would have a filter to filter out any noise. Uh, you'd have a, an analog to digital conversion or, you know, signal processing in there, and then uh, the, the output. So think of the CT coming in, filtering, and, and then the output. So the manufacturer one, for example, may take the signal right at the output, or maybe two would go somewhere in between, let's say filter after the filter or after the analog, the digital process. So you can see, depending on where they put the timestamp in their process, it's not essentially, there's nothing wrong with either place that they put it. The point is, if you're using multiple vendors uh, for on the same network, you may have a problem potentially with a little bit of an error between the signals based on the fact that the timestamp is positioned somewhere else than the other manufacturer. It's some manufacturers already have a way of uh, uh, somehow compensating for that. I'm not gonna get into too much detail. I just want to point that out that there there I don't know in debt I did not do the testing, but this is what I've I've heard. So uh so let's talk about process bus network protocols. I mentioned PRP. PRP is one of the most um uh favorable protocols to use for process bus. Uh it's parallel redundancy protocol. It is a network protocol standard for Ethernet that provides uh, essentially a seamless failover against the network component failure. It's a bumpless network. It's, it's easy to connect uh, additional IEDs without breaking the network, and I'll get into uh, an architecture in a few. Uh, external devices could be connected in the network uh, very easily. The other one is HSR. This is not as favorable. In fact, uh, some manufacturers do not even provide uh, the capability of doing it. So uh, high availability, seamless redundancy is a, it's a network protocol as well. It's also bumpless. Uh, and I'll get into that architecture as well. And you'll see based on the architecture why it's not as favorable. So PRP architecture, I'm gonna take a, an example of a breaker and a half scheme. We have merging units one, two, and three, uh, two switches, and your IEDs on the other, on, uh, connected to the switches. So if you take an example where, so what happens is that the devices, when they do PRP, they send the same exact information out of two ports simultaneously. And essentially when the information gets to where it needs to go, the well it's published on the network so it goes everywhere but the IED that is subscribing to that message essentially will take the first signal that arrives first and discard the other one so if there was a break in the system in one of the ports it's still gonna get the the information and not even know that there was a problem so it's it's you know for example based on that uh, if you had uh, one of port B, let's say, going to switch to down, uh, the line protection, for example, would not even know that uh, that happened. So it would still get the information they needed and not have any failover time whatsoever, completely oblivious to what happened. So let's take the HSR architecture. Right away, you can see the difference. Yes. This does not require as many switches as you would with PRP. However, you see it's essentially it's a ring, but the devices themselves are the means to communicate, which means that basically all the information is going through all the IEDs at any given time. So therefore the bandwidth is a problem. So there's only a certain amount of 
equipment that you could connect to in this communication loop. So I, I believe uh, roughly, and again, it depends on the situation, but the rule of thumb is no more than 30 devices on an HSR loop. So let's take a look at what happens. How Again, the same concept is that the same information leaves uh, two ports simultaneously. And again, wherever, whichever one gets to the ID first, it accepts it and tosses the other one. So let's take an example where you have a break in one of the lines. So I, you can see, again, it, it will get to where it has to go, but one side is unable to. Uh, I don't know if you can see right off the bat, but in an event, if you had an N-2 contingency, let's say, so now you have uh, a device off service and you had a problem, now you would have two breaks into the system. For example, if you had a break here and a break here, the information will not get to where it needs to go. So it's something to keep in mind. It's another con to it. So ultimately, it's not that popular, but a combination of both may be good practice. For example, maybe per a, a bay level, have an HSR loop and then go to a P overall station PRP network. There's, there's multiple options. Uh, anything can be done, and the combination of the two can provide a, a more pros than cons at times. So let's talk about goose messages. So a goose message provides real-time sharing of information between the devices in the substation. And again, like I mentioned before, it's a multicast communication, publisher, subscriber, where any device on the network can publish data and any devices can subscribe to the information that they need. The MAC address, as I stated before, uh, 01, OC, CD, and 01 as opposed to 04 for sample values. So again, 01 at the very beginning means that it's a multicast message. So you as the user decides in the config configuration what is published and what is described within the configuration files. The beauty of the configuration files is that they're universal, and I'll get into, I have a few slides on it. So you can choose which devices. You take that file, configuration file, go to another ID, and, and provide the information that it needs to listen to that message. So it's a low-level Ethernet layer, layer two. Um, there's priority tagging. So let's take an example. So think of the goose message as the tractor trailer or the, the, the transportation means. Within, in the back of that tractor trailer, you have a container. You put what is known as data sets in there or the information you want to send. It goes into the back of the trailer and it goes off into the network. Now, what happens is, I'm going to give you an example. The standard pretty much says that the goose message should not be slower than 4 milliseconds, although it can be faster at times. I've seen it at 2 milliseconds. But what happens is, let's take a trip command, for example. You, uh, that message is normally published as false, meaning you don't have a trip from an ID. The moment that you have a trip, that message uh, turns from false to a true. Uh, within four milliseconds, it's sent out. Uh, and then four milliseconds later, again, it's sent out. And then again, four milliseconds later, true, true, true. Then after that, it, it starts uh, multiplying or doubling. So every eight milliseconds, it's publishing true, then 16, true, 32, 64, 120, et cetera, until it hits the time to live. So let's say that is a second. So then at that, once it reaches a second, then every second is going to publish that true, true, 
until the change of state again in that in that data set message. So if the fault went away and the chirp went back to false, immediately go back to four milliseconds, issue a false statement and false and then eight milliseconds and so on. So it starts all over again. It's important to know that that basically you got that that heartbeat, so to speak, constantly, whether it's true or false. You could break down the the data as follows. So you within a box you have a physical device. This is your essentially your your IED, so to speak. And Within there, you have logical devices. Now you could have more than multiple. You you could have multiple logical devices within a relay. Within those logical devices, you can have data objects, such as uh, or logical nodes. I'm sorry. So logical logical nodes. Logical nodes. I'll get into what all these are, but essentially within these logical nodes, you have data objects or classes. This is, for example, uh, the one on the left, for example, this POS, uh, that XCBR is circuit breaker or switch gear information. And within this logical node, you have a data object or data class of the breaker position. And then within there, you have a data attribute. STV is a status value. So that's a Boolean on off. Actually, uh, this is a double uh, Bit. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. But every message has a quality um, attribute associated with it, and I'll get into that. The quality is important and what makes the standard very powerful. So here's another example. M is for measurement values, and this is essentially a metering value of uh, amps, and here's a few phases. So logical node, it is the smallest function in the 6150 that exchanges data. So within a, a goose message, you'll have multiple logical nodes that you can, you can throw in that container I mentioned before. Goose message, again, is the tractor trailer. In the back of the container, you have multiple logical nodes. There is, they are all uh, grouped logically. These are it right here. So you have a system, uh, L for system. This is where you would get um, uh, behavior and, and issues with your devices. P is for your protection. So this is where you're going to have your time overcurrents, diffs, uh, distance, etc. cetera. Uh, believe it or not, protection related R is where they classify breaker failure. For example, it's a protection related, not protection. Uh, same with sync check or um, I mentioned breaker failure, uh, reclosing, C for control, uh, and so on. So you see here X for switch gears. So I have just a few examples. There are a lot of logical nodes uh, in the standard. Uh, so X again, this is the logical node group. XCBR is a logical node for switch gear for circuit breaker. So this would have within the logical node multiple data objects associated with the circuit breaker. One is a block close data object. Uh, I mentioned POS for position. There, there, there's a lot. So I took a random protection uh, logical node for time overcurrent would be P, TOC. So you see that the logical nodes start with their group prefix. A message can be broken down in these multiple parts. I'll get into an example on what a message would look like. But essentially, you have your device name, your, uh, your logical device, that data, uh, data attribute. And again, here is more of a another example of logical nodes in the IEEE nomenclature associated with it. So again, distance protection, which is... Uh, 21 in logical node would be PDIS. So let's get an example. I'll get a position of a circuit breaker. So the interface to the circuit breaker can be modeled as logical node XCBR. Uh, the logical node XCBR has a data object, uh, POS, which represents the circuit breaker position. And then within that is STVAL, which is the status value. 
So, took a snapshot of what a goose message would look like. Uh, you see the control block reference is essentially your goose message. Uh, the information, the MAC address, I assigned it zeros. Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but the data set that I'm using, you could, uh, you could assign. Within the data sets, you can have multiple uh, parts of the uh, of information. So within this goose message, well, this is a different goose message, but essentially, this is one goose message, and within it is a data set with these data objects. So right here is time over current one. STR is actually your pickup. So it's it's the pickup of a time over current, whereas uh, OP down here is your actually the, your time with the time associated with it. So you can see the benefit here by having this information. You may not want to subscribe to this information, but by having it makes testing fairly easy. And you can see here the Q and T uh, uh, packets here, and I'll get into these uh, shortly. But here's your trip command. Right here, PTRC, general, it's Boolean, and then you notice that these all have quality associated with it. So what is quality? So the quality is broken up into multiple bits, is 12. They're, they, the position of the bits are defined here. So the validity is uh, the first two bits. And good would be zeros. Um, invalid zero one, reserve questionable. So, if the the validity is invalid, obviously the uh, the message is not going to be uh, accepted. Uh, uh, some of these are. I'm not going to get into what they are, um, but it's all in the standard. And essentially, some of them, based on how you program the relay, you may continue to function from a protection standpoint from these these um, these bits if they were to be true. It may not be a big deal for certain protection functions. On the other hand, if it's invalid, you know, obviously it's not, you don't want that information. So uh, the last two bits are the most important and make testing uh, 16150 uh, uh, very easy. So essentially a quality bit of zeros is basically you have everything all good. The message or the data set is good. It, um, there's, it's not in test mode. There's no issues with the, the quality is all good. Everything will go. Uh, if you have a one for any one of these, and again, it, it means something based on the position. So how do we test 6150? We're not bringing, so now you have merging units out in the yard that everything's wired to, and then you got fiber cables coming from the physical devices to the control house. So how is a tester going to take a relay out of service now without test switches, test device? Uh, what do you do? Uh, things need to change now. The, these guys right here are no longer in the station. So what can you do? Um, again, I go back to these guys here, these two bits uh, in the quality string. And within the 6150th standard, basically it talks about how to test. So a test be, bit can be utilized to put the logical device or ID in test mode. So bit 1, 1. So uh, 11, uh, bit 11 and 12 are the, are the bits. So bit 11, if this was true, the device or ID is in test mode. And then bit 12, if this was true, uh, it, it's operator blocked. And I'll get into this. So if the test bit is set to true, then any device is not in test mode, are going to ignore the, the message. Uh, you know, considering it, uh, that it's in test mode, I'm not in test mode. So it's going to ignore the message. Any other device in test mode, however, will listen to the message and they'll interact. If, again, 
that device is subscribed uh, configured to listen to the message. The uh, device to test mode will operate for messages from devices not in test mode. So it's only one direction, so to speak. So that, that IED that you put in test mode will still see um, objects or messages not in test mode. And however, their, the output of the IED is going to be ignored by objects. So consider a... Let's let's say a, for example, a line protection relay. Uh, you put that in test mode. However, an emerging one is not. So the interaction there will it will still uh, see the information coming to it, but any output signal is not. So, and to um, to put a log a logical node or logical device can be put in test mode using the data object of MOD of LL, LLN0. So LLN0.MOD is how you would put the device in test mode. Here's a snapshot from the standard itself. Um, again, so you have an incoming signal and the queue is in test. It's, you can see here, invalid um, incoming signal. So that here's a here's an example. So I'm going to go to an example. So test mode on the quality bit packet essentially would have all zeros considering again that the quality is good and the only thing you did was put in test mode this bit would be true and you the rest would be zeros. Uh operator block you'd have both bits enabled and the rest zeros. So let's take an example. You put line protection in test mode on. So now the PTRC, which is uh, trip, by the way, it's a logical note for trip. Uh, so the last digits of Q is one zero. The signal, the trip is published onto the network and the IED rejects the message as in test mode and does nothing. And same with the merging unit. It is going to reject the message and does nothing. So now what if you have both the merging unit and line protection in test mode? The, again, same situation. You have a trip. The breaker failure relay is going to reject the message and do nothing. However, the merging unit accepts the message quality uh, because it's in test mode and therefore output contact closes to trip the breaker. So let's take another example. So now you have test mode on but operator block on the merging unit. So PTRC Q bit is, is on test mode. The same trip command again is sent to the merging unit it is now it's again the breaker failure is going to reject the message the merging unit accepts the message however the output contact does not close because you are, are uh, in block so nothing let's talk about simulation mode uh, just briefly uh, essentially simulation mode can be enabled by using uh, another logical node, LPHD, in the data object sim. So it allows the IED to process the simulated message instead of the actual message. So you can use another device to simulate messages. Uh, so this, for example, your test set from Omicron or Doble, you could simulate a message. So this is another testing functions. Uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about some testing benefits. So here's a snapshot of what a typical test plan would look like today for conventional relays. Uh, you have, you know, for example, you can see here uh, going down the line all the steps uh, for a conventional relay like this for a line protection typically has 200 steps associated with it. But I want to focus on something like this. You can see that they set an output contact just to test 
one protection element at a time, and they go down the line. So, for example, protection engineer assigns a trip command, which that trip command is is uh, asserted by multiple different protection functions, such as line protection, maybe overcurrent backup, uh, you name it. So what the relay testers are doing are modifying those relay settings just to output one function at a time, the pickup or the, the time over current uh, output, uh, you name it. So I would just keep that in mind. So what I propose an idea on how to do testing with 61850, I'm actually writing a paper on this, but so you could take that and and convert it to 61850. So your, your test plan could have a step that automatically puts the device in test mode. Uh, and your second step, for example, could be putting it in simulation mode. So you, there's, there's stuff in place, there's test sets that do this today. So now, again, taking those steps that we talked about before, you don't need to so a, a relay technicians, again, modify the relay settings to test each element. So they assign an output with these protection elements step by step. So they go in, they do a step, then they'll change the output and assign another protection element associated with it. So then the trip output, again, is comprised of multiple operations. So a line distance would have phase zone one, zone two, zone three. Same with ground, a time over current protection element. So what you can now have, uh, here's the power behind this, is that a goose message again, one goose message that comes out of that, that line protection relay, but you have multiple data sets. So for example, you could have testing data objects as well as your actual operation objects. For example, your, your trip. Um, break or failure. So th this is um, this is your your trip command, for example, which your merging unit is going to subscribe to. Same with your break or failure is going to be subscribed as well to another device. However, these other ones, like your ground time over current, pick up and or operate. This is operate. Um, and, and here's your, your pickup, for example. These, could, these again, are all in the, in the Goose message, and they're there, but the devices don't need to subscribe to it. So essentially, the relay tech now no longer needs to modify relay settings to test these elements because they're already there. He just has to see it on the network. Whereas part of this data set has operational data objects that are subscribed to devices. So again, remember, it's a publisher subscriber where it's constantly published on the network. You plug into the network, you can see this data set. With a test set, you could easily uh, look at this and do your testing function. So uh, this is what I'm writing my paper on, actually, uh, the, what, a testing procedure on basically utilizing uh, the opportunity of goose messages and the amount of data you could put in a goose message, I think it's I think it's pretty good. So uh, it, it, think about that. It's it's pro, it's good. I think it's a good idea, you know. And so let's get into substation configuration language. So this is this is the basically how sixty one eight fifty works when it goes down to multiple vendors and making this in op, uh, operability. So the language again is specified by sixty one eight fifty. Uh, it, it specifies the data representation. It's used for exchanging files between devices. So it includes access points, communication, logical devices, the nodes. It's XML based, and I took a snapshot of what like a typical message, part of a particular message, would look like. So there's multiple file types. So I'm going to get into. Uh, these one at a time, they all are equally important and serve a function. So substation configuration description, that essentially is, it's a file that describes a complete substation detail. Think of it more of a, uh, say, like a single line or an overview 
of an entire substation, all the communication, ID, data, etc. Um, system specification description, SSD file, uh, it, it contains the complete specification of the substation, including the single line diagram and logical notes. So again, these are all, this is the it, from the whole substation concept. So it's an overview, like the second bullet says, it, it basically it's a single line of your communication. Uh, configuration ID description. Uh, this is a file basically, this is used for communication between IED configuration tool and it's considered basically a stripped down SCD file. It, it only has what the IED in question needs to know for communication. So for example, this statement here, what does that mean? So between an IED configuration tool. So let's take, I'm going to throw some, I'm going to throw some manufacturers out there. Uh, let's say you're dealing with a Schweitzer relay and a GE uh, UR relay. And so a Schweitzer would use normally uh, Architect is their software for setting up IEC 6150 communication. Uh, whereas GE uses InterVista. So those configuration tools or uh, software is for the device themselves. So you can configure the devices to uh, what messages to publish and as well essentially you'll use the same tool to subscribe but here's how it works so you you create messages that you want to publish from let's say a Schweitzer in the architect tool now you export a file called CID file when you're done take that CID file and now load it in the Vista where then you take that those messages that you're publishing and map it into the UR relay, telling it which messages from the Schweitzer that you need, that you want to listen to, essentially. So that, that's what the CID file is used for. ICD as well, it's the same concept. It's just, it, they, each one of them serves a purpose, and I'm not gonna get into detail. Each one of these topics I covered today is is hours on itself uh, to get into detail. I'm just giving you an overview of what to kind of look for. So these these again, they're all uh, different types of SCL files. So just to wrap it up, why would we want to change status quo? Uh, I mean, essentially, why p you could see the power behind the standard. You could you could de essentially, it's all about money, right? The bottom line is decrease capital costs. A lot of people, that's what they focus on, but it really isn't just that. I, I think the other ones are more important uh, or equally important, I should say. So how do you decrease capital costs? Well, you can have a smaller footprint. Uh, data, historical data has shown that you can reduce your control house by two-thirds. If you think about it, uh, by not having to run all that control cable and all the test switches and uh, uh, pistol grip uh, control switches and whatnot, uh, you can reduce the size substantial. Uh, you reduce the wiring, of course, the trenching involved, conduit. Uh, you, you need very little of this now, and all the labor associated with it. You could build a substation in less time. Time is a big commodity in this world. It is the commodity. So by having a can size design, you can essentially just copy and paste it if you have a standard design, and uh, in no time you could build a substation fairly quickly. Engineering is reduced, uh, engineering time as well as construction time, uh, again a lot less wiring involved. Uh, lower transducer costs, a lot of people don't think of this, but a single merging unit can deliver sample values to any device on the network. So. Uh, you don't have to run a, a conductor to multiple relays, essentially. It's, it goes to the control house via fiber, and that, if that device is connected to the network, you just subscribe to the sample values. Lower commissioning costs uh, as well, because a lot of this can be done off-site and commissioned before you get to a substation. And then once you roll into a substation make the connections, 
a lot less commissioning is involved because most of the, the testing you've already done ahead of time. So, and, and the increased flexibility, let's say you have a protection scheme and then two years down the road, you need to add or modify it. So therefore you now need to add a few extra relays to do this. Um, the CT and PT information that you may need or tripping that you may need to do, you don't have to wire a trip contact, for example, all the way to a circuit breaker. Again, you just plug the device in, configure it, and it will. you configure it to subscribe to the current or voltage or tripping breaker statuses, etc. So theoretically, in a day, you could install a relay very easily. And uh, one of the main benefits is the proactive condition base, uh, the monitoring associated with it. There's a lot of uh, maintenance requirements uh, that can be reduced because you have a constantly monitored system. For example, you have mer merging unit on each side of the breaker that's constantly looking at the current on both sides of the breaker or even merging unit from system A and system B. So if the you could program logic to say that if the current drifts past a certain percentage, then you send a flag to EMS and you know and and you you solve the problem. So again, cable trays full of wiring can now be reduced to a handful of fiber. It's pretty impressive. Uh, I know you're probably looking at it like, yeah, I believe it when I see it. I I'm have done some testing and I could tell you that it does it does work so I'm gonna leave it at that uh, you see my that's my son there he's subscribing to goose uh, hit me up with an email with any questions let me know what you think of this video uh, click like subscribe uh, I appreciate any feedback this is my first time creating something like this and if I get enough likes or comments I might go and add more uh, detailed tutorials, maybe even get into uh, power engineering uh, type uh, lectures uh, if you're interested. So let me know. Thank you.